Gail, we've seen the footage from those original home movies, which is quite right. remarkable that you've kept them all these years. How have you used that film over the years? Well, I've used it since I took it the first time uh, through the different documentaries. There have been a lot of documentaries, and they all ask for that film. And uh, the last uh, group I, I loaned it to uh, enhanced it a bit. I don't know how they did that, but that worked out really well. Well, there are new digital techniques, you know, in yeah. which they can improve almost yeah. everything except your heart. I mean, that <laughs> yeah. doesn't need any digital improvement. Oh, you. Do you still see in your mind's eye the faces of those children that you saw that day that changed your life? Do you still see them in your memory? I, I do, because they were so remarkable. The imprint occurred when they stood face to face across the barbed wire, and not one of them asked for chocolate. They were so grateful for flour to be free. They just said, look, the weather's good right now, and later on it's gonna be bad. When that happens, don't worry about us. We don't need enough to eat. Just give us a little. So those faces, a little blue-eyed girl, I, I never forget, she was the one that had the best command of English, and she was right at the front and she'd translate. All I could say was guten tag those days, and, mm -hmm. but she, I'll never forget that little girl. She had some boys' trousers on, and mixed top, and it, it was uh, it just absolutely unique. Uh, one of the f f most interesting th times of seeing the, the kids from the ground was in East Berlin. Uh, they asked me to drop over there, and they didn't have any chocolate either. One day I came over in and saw a, a soccer game going on for the whole group of kids. Uh, it's, we deviated our flight plan a little bit, made a drop, and the kids left the, the, the soccer ball and just chased the parachutes clear out of, out of the country. But the faces of the children, uh, so, so eager and, and intense at the fence. Well, those children are now grown. Yeah. Have you stayed in touch with some of them over the years? Yes. Uh, a few months ago, I stayed with a, a little girl that was uh, and her family who who was nine years old at the time. And, and there are many that I've kept in talking about going back to Berlin, which I do quite often now. When you first went to your crew members and said you wanted to do this, did any of them say, hey, Al, this is risky. I don't know whether we can do this or not. Yeah, when I said, give me your ration, <laughs> they said, what you're gonna do, buy a camera on the black market? And <laughs> we probably could. They said, you're gonna do that? And I said, yeah, I promised the kids, give me your ration. So they gave me the ration. I had a big double handful. I thought, wow, hit him in the head with that going 110 miles an hour. Give us a problem. So I put three parachutes on it. But they did. They, they were very reluctant. After a while, the press caught on. I remember seeing movie tone news, newsreels yeah. about oh, the yeah. candy bomber yeah. when I was a youngster yeah. in the movie theater. Did you have any idea? that it would become a lifelong mission for you to talk not just about what happened then, mm -hmm. but about the spirit behind it. Well, I had no idea, Tom. I, I was hoping nobody would know about it. Well, you know, I didn't have permission, and so I, I just I was astounded when we almost hit a newspaper man in the head of the candy bar in Berlin, and he got, had photos of my airplane with a tail number and parachutes coming out of it. And then, the, boy, that, that, that was a, a problem. I came back from a flight from Berlin to Rhine Mine, and an uh, officer met the airplane and says, uh, my Colonel Hahn wants to see you right now. I said, what for? And he'll tell, he'll tell you. And when in, he said, Alverson, what have you been doing? I've been flying like mad, sir. Not stupid, he said. What else have you been doing? And for 15 minutes, I thought it was going to be court martial. He pulled out a newspaper, threw it on the counter, and there is a picture of my airplane, tail number and all, parachutes coming out of it. Well, General Tunner called down to Hahn and says, Hahn, what are you doing dropping parachutes over Berlin? Oh, General, you know we're not dropping parachutes over Berlin. We're landing this on the ground, the sergeant this stuff. Hahn, you better wake up and find out what's going on in your outfit, clunk. I learned a lesson in management from that, Tom. Don't try and impress your boss's boss. Take care of your boss, and he'll take care of you. I didn't want anybody to know about it, especially those guys. You must have been astonished when the candy started pouring in from around the world. American candy makers, I think, donated 18 tons before it was yeah, all over, right? More than that, actually. Yeah, they did. Uh, first of all, the weekly reader kids started saying it like mad. That was a staple in every classroom in America, the yeah, weekly reader, right? that's right. And then, then I ran out of parachutes, and all of a sudden, 
I was getting one letter a week from my future wife, Ali Jolly, and then I had barracks bags full of, of envelopes full of handkerchiefs because I'd run out. And some of them were black lace, and some of them were proposal for marriage, and I had all kinds of things going. So Aldous agreed to marry me when I got back. <laughs> Tell me about the, uh, the messages that you got from some of the youngsters that, that you still remember, and there are larger lessons in those messages yeah. as well. Well, one that's very choice to me is Peter Zimmerman. He was, he was uh, seven years old, and uh, he wrote me and he says, look, uh, I'm not getting any of this stuff. Bigger kids are beating me to it. He gave me a map. And he saw the, a parachute and he didn't get it. And he made me a parachute, strings the right length and everything. And the map says, when you take off, come down the Spray River, turn run two blocks, and I'm going to bum that house in the corner. I'll be in the backyard every day at 2 o'clock. And I had a hard time hitting Peter, the wind or whatever, bigger kids. And finally he wrote me a letter and he said, look, you're a pilot? I gave you a map. How'd you guys win the war anyway? We got to be good friends and mailed him a big package. Then he, he wrote me and said, well, I hate to bother you with this, but my, sh my shoes are shot and I've just got uh, cardboard in the bottoms of them. And my dad and mom were killed in the war and with my uncle and he didn't have any money. And I said, well, we'll fix that. So he put his foot on a piece of paper and drew, a, drew a, an outline of his foot. And we got him a beautiful pair of boots, got to Berlin, we mailed it to Peter Zimmerman. He, I had a barracks bag in my room, uh, several of them, with different categories of letters. And he wanted, he wrote, he wanted to be adopted by anybody in America. And I'd send stuff to the State Department and just didn't know what to do with it. But he was adopted by a family in Palm, Pennsylvania, Peter Zimmerman was. And did you stay in touch with him? Yes, for, for, until about uh, 25 years ago, and the letters stopped coming. But mm. the little girl, Mercedes, she was nine years old, and she wrote me a letter and taking me a task, and look, you guys, you're, you're causing this real problem. You know, we got some chickens, and you're coming right over our apartment house and scaring them, and they're not laying eggs, and they're losing their feathers. The last paragraph says, when you see the white chickens, drop it there. I don't care if it scares them. Well, <laughs> You wanted the candy. You wanted the candy. That was primary. Well, I couldn't find Mercedes. So... I told the guys, bomb the approach. We plastered the approach. We still didn't hear it. Took a big box of chocolate and gum and, and mailed it to Mercedes. When I went back to, uh, to Berlin in 1970 as a commander, now a colonel, got invitations to come to dinner for everybody ever caught a parachute. We couldn't. It was out every night uh, to receptions. We just couldn't turn them down them all. But this letter kept coming in 1972, 73. And I said, we're going to answer that letter Went to the house with an invitation. A lady came down the stairs with her husband and a couple of boys. She came upstairs and went into the front room and, without introducing themselves at all and opened the china cabinet door and handed me a letter. And I stamped 1948, November 1948. And I opened it and I'd written to her in different cities. I can't find your, your house or your white chickens, but I hope this is okay that I'd send her that stuff. Well, uh, last year I stayed at her house three times last year, uh, two times this year. I'll be there again in May, staying with Mercedes. With now, they're naming a school after you. Yes, I just heard that Marlene Dietrich got beat out by an old bald-headed guy, <laughs> and they've, they're, uh, they've got a school naming, and I'll go back for that. But let's talk about, for just a moment, yeah. as we conclude here, about the larger lessons. You grew up on kind of a hard scrabble farm in Utah. Uh, yeah. Everything that you and your father and your family got, you had to earn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you get thrown into the uh, Army Air Corps as a pilot, yeah. fighting the biggest war ever. Yeah. And I think that probably helped you on that moment when you took two sticks of gum and divided them into four parts. Know that, as your dad said, from little things, big things can happen. That's certainly true, Tom. You know... When things are, are tough, you have to help people and your neighbors. And I'd hurry and get through thinning our sugar beets on our field and, and help somebody else. And sometimes they wouldn't have anything to give you, but you know you had to serve others. The fulfillment in life comes from service. Getting outside yourself. Dead Sea's dead because wraps his arms around all the fresh water and lets nothing out. We have Dead Sea souls. But that 
year, those years, uh, help people in the hay, and they'd come and help you. But it's that synergy, the synergy between service before self and, and the responding gratitude, the expressed gratitude that comes back, puts together the thing that brought down the wall. That's what service before self does. Getting out of yourself, thinking of somebody else. And those kids, the, the fence, wanted chocolate more than anything. Around the world, they'd grab my arm and give it to me. And not one of them would put out their hand in, in physical gesture or voice inflection and say, don't dummy, don't you want chocolate? And until I turned and left, it didn't hit me. That silent gratitude discovered is the most powerful. But that synergy and attitude, the Germans slept in bombed out buildings without he heat, with 30 pounds of coal a month, and, and, and electricity from two o'clock in the morning for two hours. Now, everybody who's been watching you during all of this has wondered, is this the same flight suit that you wore when you were flying then? And how have you kept yourself in such good shape if uh -huh. that's the case? Well, I made a big boo-boo today, with well, several of them. <laughs> but when I answered that improperly about it got it big enough to fit me, that was terrible because <laughs> the real answer to that, Tom, should have been that uh, I wore this flight suit into Berlin with a load of 20,000 pounds of flour on Christmas Eve. And it was one of the best Christmases I ever had in my life, coming into that city with that. And it is. Flew it into Berlin on Christmas night. And that is the same flight? The same one. Well, look at the moth holes. <laughs> yeah. Well, in my book, it's, I'm standing here with this flight suit with my co-pilot and engineer, the guys that we dropped the first parachutes out of. And this is the outfit I got on. 1945 vintage. You're still in the cockpit at this yeah, age. Yeah. And when you get up there, and you've slipped the surly bonds of earth, as yeah, they say. Yeah. Do you think to yourself, Hal Halverson, you're the luckiest guy in the world? You, you stole my vine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look at it, and, and, and the mosaic, the, the cre God's creation, and the mosaic, the green patches, the other contrasting patches, the mounds, the stream, uh, and it, well, it's ethereal, it's ethereal. And when I fly solo, and I used to have a powered parachute until a little while ago. But when I'd been in the, in the military, when I had an airplane and, and the clouds were building up, I'd, the tire, and I'd fly through them, expect to hear to see an angel dining next to me, maybe a, a chair, a broken chair, and I, it would just fly in between those clouds. Well, I wrote a poem about that. But uh, it's, uh, it's an extra sensory feeling that you never get over. I got started before the war in flying business and never got over it, still doing it. You know, I've been privileged to meet a lot of great people in my lifetime. You go right to the top of the list. It's been a great privilege, Al. Oh, well, God bless you. Thanks, Al. Yeah, God bless you. Thanks.